What's going on guys? It is uh, the second video from here in Greenland. We are in Kangerlussak. We're heading to Sisamut and it looks like it's gonna be a really, really awesome destination. So we're just waiting for the bus here at the youth hostel. Greg's over there doing Greg things. And uh, we're gonna go. Hopefully make some pictures and have a bit of an adventure. My bag in, and I'm gonna pay the man. Uh, yeah, hold on. Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> this coffee, fun fact, was brewed by uh, Greenlandic monks. I have seen that. Yeah. Um, and it comes from the hills of Greenland. It's the only coffee in the world that's grown outside of the coffee belt. Okay. And tastes? Tastes like muskox eggs. Yeah. Fermented or just regular? No real ones, normal ones, just the regular. You know the muskox, the way they just come right out of the oxen. Yeah. Fall. They're about this size. So we just got to the airport and that is security control for international flights. But in Greenland, catching a plane is almost like catching a bus. So this is the gate for the national flights and there's no security. We literally checked in right there. <laughs> We're gonna walk two feet over here to catch the plane, no security flight. Uh, I shouldn't be saying that there's no good security, should I? It's a good place to steal a plane. Once an Air Force base, this is the largest airport in Greenland. And though it's massive in size, it feels like a country airport. We just wander out onto the grayscape of the runway and onto the plane. Did you know that because we're getting onto a Canadian aircraft, we have priority and we get the front two seats? I did not know that, but yeah. lucky for you, I can fly one of these. You can fly? Let's go, let's fly it. Vamos. This next footage is Greg flying this plane. The windows on the plane weren't really conducive to good footage, but I assure you, the views down the fjord to Sisamute were epic. And after attempting to say thank you in Greenlandic, tuck tuck, but sounding more like a broken duck, we landed in the overwhelmingly photogenic Sisamute, where even the airport is worthy of a photo. We just landed in Sisamute, we got to our hotel, and it is really, really cool here. Really beautiful, you've got these old houses and churches, and it's all kind of built up on this rocky, craggy shoreline. It is absolutely so cool here. I said in my last video that Kangerlussak wasn't exactly photogenic. This is the epitome of photogenic. I feel like anywhere I turn the camera, there's potentially a photo here. So we're gonna walk around now, um, because we can't check into our hotel yet, and then we'll find somewhere to photograph sunset as well. Originally a base to the Danish whaling industry, Sisamute was first settled by the Danish in 1764. These days, it's still an important hub for the Greenlandic fishing industry, but it clings beautifully to its historical past.
There's about 5,000 dog sledding, snowmobiling, winter loving locals that live here. And nearly every residential building in town is photogenic. And though I'm not actually taking too many photos, everything here is photo worthy. Literally everything. So like a tourist, I wander around snapping away at images. And while there's little thought that goes into them, due to the photogenic nature of this town, they're all right. So Sissimut's a really, really cool town. I'm really enjoying it so far, just wandering around town. It's really, really photogenic. Uh, it is kind of cold right now, although the sun is out, but there is some absolutely beautiful light hitting all the houses and cabins. I guess they're not cabins, the houses. And this mountain peak over here has some clouds lifting up over it. Really hoping they peel away, but you know it looks, it looks really like? epic right now. You know what it looks like? Sorry to interrupt. Cape Town. Yeah, dude. And I was actually just gonna say before Greg jumped in and stole the thunder <laughs> that I actually get like Cape Town vibes. Despite the fact it's cold, it really feels like that with the big table mountains and the lingering clouds and the harbor. It really kind of feels like Cape Town in the weirdest, weirdest way. And I'm loving it. Anyways, there's an iceberg in the harbor right now and there's no icebergs in Cape Town. <laughs> and we're gonna go see if we can find an angle to photograph the iceberg with this insane cloud scene behind us. So let's go do it. On the way to the harbor, we get distracted by images. Thankfully though, the good light here lingers so long this time of year that we have plenty of time. Eventually, we wandered past cloud-shredded peaks in the glistening harbor towards our eventual photo location. Sorry about the close-up to my face. But on the 24 to 70, I just wanted to say that it's funny how remote the tourism feels, but still how it's here. We've done this hike out to the island, or they call it the island even though it's attached now to the mainland. The island and I was told there was a hiking trail, but when you come there, the hiking trail, it, it more looks like a goat path. There's hardly a trail. It's just not used at all. And so you worry that you're not in the right place. And then every now and then you come to a picnic table or you come to a sign with information that's talking about how there was houses here at one point and like tourism boards. It's absolutely crazy that there's this infrastructure here, even though there's it just doesn't feel like there should be, and it's kind of awesome. And the light looks kind of awesome, so we're trying to find an angle to photograph uh, around sunset of these icebergs and the peaks in the background, and I think we're almost to where we want to be. We made our way along the rudimentary trail, over some rocks, and down to the shore where gently lapping waves crashed onto the rocks. The view of the three pillars of ice perfectly in the frame of view. Okay, so I think I found a spot that I'd like to try to take a photo. The icebergs are way over there. Um, there's some waves crashing up here. And there's a bit of dead space in the middle of the image, but I think it's still gonna work. I'm gonna use my polarizer. I'm gonna use the 24 to 70 and I don't know, play around with probably a half second exposure or something like that and just see how this comes out. It's really, really beautiful. It's really rugged and I think this image could work. So let's set up the gear.
So this is one of the great dichotomies of photography. It's, you've got these clouds up top, on top of this peak, that are rolling so fast, and they look absolutely epic with like a five or six second exposure. They look smooth and rolled out, and they look awesome. But if you do that, your foreground looks a little bit boring and flat. You flatten out all the waves. Ideally, I'd like to be about a half second on the waves in the foreground and 30 seconds on the waves up top. Some people might composite, but I think that looks weird when one thing's obviously a longer exposure than the other. So I'm kind of splitting the difference and going for 10 second exposures here. I've got a polarizer, a six stop ND, and a two stop medium grad ND on. I've got a square crop and I, I like it. But we're still two hours until sunset, so we got lots of time to explore and try to find a couple other compositions. So, the other, I'm gonna definitely get wet sitting this way, but that's okay. <laughs> the other great, well, yep, got wet, right on cue. The other great dichotomy, I guess it's not a dichotomy, but choice you have to make when you're doing landscape photography is how much land, how many things, how much stuff in your frame. Right now we have the icebergs way up there with the beautiful, <laughs> with the beautiful uh, clouds on top of the beautiful mountain. And that alone is a frame. But I'm a seascape photography addict and I'm addicted to getting really cool waves in the four frames of my images, which is why I'm always standing <laughs> right at the edge of water getting soaked by Arctic waters. Because I want that water in the foreground. But by doing so, so often means that I have to make the mountain smaller or make the iceberg smaller. So my frame is 17 millimeters, which is really wide and makes these skyscraper sized uh, icebergs look quite small in the frame, but I actually think I'm okay with it. I think I, I think I still really like this frame, even though it doesn't really show how big those icebergs are. They're there, they're just a little bit subtle. And I have switched away from the longer exposure. I'm back to like 0.6 seconds on these exposures. So this is the photo. The photo is good, but I want it to be great. And I don't want to sit around waiting for it to be great. So with the light getting better, I take a risk. Another constant question we have in photography is when to settle and when to keep going. And the photo I had was nice. It really was. And I would have been happy to settle with it. And actually the light's getting nicer and nicer and I feel stupider and stupider <laughs> for leaving it. But I don't like taking the same photo over and over again. I don't like settling. I like constantly searching. So I've hiked halfway down the cliff edge towards the iceberg. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping that I find something nicer, but it's a bit of a scramble, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's a bit of a scramble through these rocks to get there. But hopefully it's worth it. It is worth it. Getting closer to the ice gives me more options and the light is getting epic. Woo! So this is pretty wild up here, um, but I actually think this is better than it was back there, potentially. It's a little bit more rugged, a little bit more wild, and I think there's maybe two photos I wanna to try to take here. One with this rugged water foreground, and maybe even a long one, a long lens photo with a really long exposure of just the ice and the clouds. So I think I'm gonna stick it out here. It was definitely the right move advancing my location. When all is said and done, I'll make three photos up here that I really love. 
The first image is with a long lens, minimalist and doused in incredible light. Then, I swap back to my wide angle. I'm trying to make a photo. Pow, 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 sound effects included. Um, but by the time I got set up, I feel like I kind of missed the best light. The sun doesn't travel up and down in the Arctic, it travels across the horizon. And in doing so, it's moved to an angle that is no longer, wow, that was close, no longer lighting up the rock face. Okay, maybe I was being hard on myself. The light is still pretty stellar. So I'm hanging on this cliff pretty precariously, and I've actually already been pretty close to getting washed in. Uh, but I made a big mistake. I totally forgot that I had my polarizer on, and there's all this really beautiful golden light on the rocks in the foreground, and it made the, whoa, that's the light I wanted, uh, the wave I wanted. It made the golden light look gray. And you really have to be careful with the polarizer because it does that. It cuts out the reflection of light. And sometimes that light, that's what I wanted, yes. Sometimes the reflection of that light is beautiful light. And so I think the image before looked kind of dull. Whereas now it's got this beautiful orange tone to it. And I think is a better photo in the foreground, even if the background's not as good because the sun's just going behind the horizon now. Ooh, that's the wave I wanted. Uh, but overall, I think this final spot I've come to is the best spot. So when you're doing landscape photography, don't settle. Don't just go to the first place you see and photograph it. Take that photo, then move on and explore. And eventually you'll be able to pick which one the best one is and take that at sunset. So that's what we're doing. Sun's going down the horizon. We're going to bed.